First of all, thank you, Caroline. I love you too. Happy Father's Day to all you fathers out there. Uh, I didn't have this note last time, so you guys are in for a treat. This is going to add just that next level for second service here. Um, well, we are glad that you are here. Um, I'm one of the pastors. I oversee the, the children and the youth, so everything from this big up to bigger, and now many of them bigger than me, um, so all the way through, as well as our life groups, um, and so I'm, I'm thankful for an opportunity to be here. Um, like I said, happy Father's Day. Uh, this is just a really uh, special moment for me. Um, two years ago to this Sunday was the first service I ever sat in at Church on the Rock, so uh, Father's Day two years ago, I sat right back there where my buddy Sam is, I think about that row, and, um, and heard the word from Pastor Josh, and it was a, uh, not a great time in my journey, which is what we're going to kind of be talking about today, the journey that God has us on, and hearing his voice. And so I was at a time in my journey where I was uh, working full-time at a restaurant as a restaurant manager, and every Sunday was taken every Sunday. It was just the nature of the beast. And, um, and I got to get away. It was Father's Day. So I had somebody kind of step in for me. I was like, at least give me this one. So for six months, I hadn't been attending a Sunday morning service. And I remember sitting back there and just feeling like, I need this back in my life. A couple more months go by. And then about September, I was sitting over here uh, in the third row. And, um, and I didn't know it at the time how much of a, uh, of a crybaby Pastor Josh is, but, um, but he got to see me firsthand. And so I break down in the third row and just, I just needed to be here. I was kind of doing every other Sunday thing, but all my thoughts were still back, you know, on work and, and it just was not a good place for me to be in. Um, and so eventually my journey took me here part time and, um, and now full time, which is awesome, which I'm really excited about. Uh, so that, that, that's new. And so just the just next step for me, and, and I appreciate the opportunity that, that all of you, uh, every single person that's in here, every single person uh, that is sitting at home watching online, you all have given me this opportunity to um, make this a part of my journey. And so um, I'm excited to serve you and prayerfully serve you well. And, um, but that, that was hard, uh, you know, recognize that I just wasn't in the right place wasn't in the right place, but looking back on it now, I can see uh, what God was doing there. I could see how he was moving in my life. In the moment, it was harder, and I had people speaking into my life, and um, you know, I have an awesome wife. Uh, my wife, Catherine, is up here at the front. Yeah, that's all right. You can give it up for Catherine. Um, so we, we will celebrate 13 years of marriage next month. 13 years. Our, our marriage is a teenager whatever that means. Um, and then uh, because of that, uh, I get to celebrate Father's Day today because um, our son Paul is 10 years old. Paul turned 10 just two weeks ago. This is, uh, this is birthday month for our kids. So Paul turned 10 two weeks ago. Uh, he's awesome. He's active. Uh, we love playing video games. Yes, he's already getting better than me, um, but it's fun. Uh, it, it's a good challenge. I do, lo I do love video games. Uh, and then my daughter just turned eight when was that again? Yesterday. yesterday. So Caroline turned eight yesterday. She turned eight yesterday, which, which is awesome. Uh, so being a dad uh, is definitely one of my favorite roles. Um, definitely one of my favorite roles. And growing up, uh, just raise your hand. Have, did you ever get the question asked to you? Or have you ever asked the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Anybody? Anybody ever heard that, right? Pretty popular statement. What do you want to be when you grow up? Um, well, my answer was pretty easy when I was little. My dad worked for the St. John's County Sheriff's Office here for 32 years uh, before he uh, passed away a few years ago. And, um, and so the answer was easy. Any kid, your dad is a police officer. What are you going to be when you grow up? A police officer, right? That's just what I wanted to be. Um, but... Uh, through circumstances, uh, my parents uh, ended up getting divorced, and, uh, and I still got to spend a lot of time with both of them, which was awesome, but um, a huge blessing um, is I had brothers that were born when I was about middle school age, and so one of my bros is right here on the front. What's up, James? And, uh, and so when they were born, something changed in me, and I don't know how vocal I was with it, but I knew uh, when somebody asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up, my answer changed, and that answer was a dad. I wanted to be a father. I just knew it. And so all through high school, like I was looking forward to a family, um, thinking about college or going into the military. And, and the biggest 
deterrent from me making certain decisions was the fact that I knew I wanted a family and I wanted to start a family soon. Um, and so I ended up marrying my wife while we were at Flagler College. Um, I was 20. I was just a baby. Those wedding photos, man, bald head, looked like a little kid. And, um, and it was just a very different time, but, but, but I had, you know, God had given me what I wanted. I got married, and then we had Paul, and it's been an awesome, awesome 13 years. Uh, but my daughter's birthday came up yesterday, and, uh, and her grandmother, Catherine's mom, uh, got her this little book series called The Oregon Trail. Anybody ever remember The Oregon Trail? It was a really cheap computer game, but at the time when I was in elementary school, like, it was the thing. You know, it, you, you could hit one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and you could move up, right, left, down, and that was it. And I remember playing it in school, um, <clears throat> but the books, uh, they're, they're the books where when you... Um, when you're reading them, you don't just read from beginning to end. There are kind of checkpoints throughout the books where you can make choices. So you can either choose to go across the river where you are, you know, pack everything up and float your things across, go to page 61 to do that, or you can continue reading and we're going to travel down further south on the river and cross at a bridge where it might be safer, but it's going to take longer. There could be bandits. So you have to make choices. And so as you go, and I always liked reading those books when I, when I was younger because um, I would read it one way and then I would start back over and I would take the journey again. And I would see, what, what happens if I go to this page? Or sometimes I would just read both choices and then decide which one I want to take. But I already took both of them, so it kind of defeated the purpose. Um, but the Oregon Trail was all about the journey. It was all about the journey. It had nothing to do with Oregon. When you beat the game, which few people rarely did, when you beat the game, you, it says you crossed the river, you made it to Oregon, screen goes black. That was it, <laughs> right? So the whole time you're playing this game, trying to get to Oregon, and then it just blacks out. I'm like, okay. Um, but that's what I want to talk about today. The importance of our journey, the journey that God has us on. It's not all about the destination, but our culture will tell us that it is about the destination. We are in a culture of convenience. And Pastor Aldrich was kind of alluding to it last week, just as, as generations come uh, and, and go and things change. But we are, we are currently in, a, in, a, um, in an age where we try to cut out everything in the middle. I want what I want, and I want it now. And oftentimes, it's not about what we need, but it is about what we want and getting it faster, getting it more quickly. Um, I think it's really funny that it is you know, cheaper to buy a meal from McDonald's than it is to, to cook sometimes in you know, real vegetables and you know, real organic meat. Um, and so that's just where we are as a culture. Um, so a few goals that kind of happen in life. Graduation is a goal. Uh, it's a great goal. Uh, we just had some of our high schoolers graduate. Um, but without the 13 years of schooling, without kindergarten through 12th grade, you don't walk across the platform. Without those experiences, without meeting people, without people speaking into your life and, and doing all these different things, uh, that goal just isn't met. But so many of our students, and, and if you're a parent, especially of a middle school or high schooler, how often do you hear somebody say, I just can't wait till I graduate? I just can't wait till I graduate, right? It's always about that next thing instead of enjoying and living in the moment. Uh, watching our children grow up. My goal for my children, for Paul and Caroline, is to see them be successful um, and to be independent. And so by 18, 19, or 20, I would love to see them kind of moving out and, and starting their own, own thing. Uh, but the reality is, some people, it's 25, it's 30, it's 35, that independence thing, right? Something went wrong in the journey. And then as a parent, you start hearing your, your children say, oh, yeah, my, my parents live with me. And you're like, wait, you live in my house. And then you start hearing your kids say, oh, my parents live above my basement. Um, and you're like, wait, no, you live in my basement. Something went wrong in the journey. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Um, even on our wedding day, um, the wedding day was a blur. And so we have a photographer and a videographer just so we can remember that that journey, that there was an experience. I don't remember what we ate. I don't remember my sister singing. Like, I missed a lot of things because, you know, it was, it was all about the vow. It was about getting through and the whirlwind. Um, but if you'll go ahead at this time and uh, take out your worship guide and, and the notes, if you haven't done so yet, uh, thank you to my, my front rowers. They're ready to go. They've got, they've got pens. But take a look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. 
It says, in the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. So that everyone will praise our heavenly Father. So we want all to see what we do. And that can be a bad statement if we want them to see what we do for our sake. But the reason we want people to see our good deeds is because prayerfully, they have come from our Father in heaven, and that's what we should be showing. When people look at our lives, they should see what we're doing. They should recognize what we're doing and say, there's something different about that person. There's something that I see in them, and and I want that. And it should be this. They should see our heavenly Father. They should be able to praise like you know, man, that is awesome the way you cared for those people. That's awesome. You brought them a meal when they were sick. Do you even know your neighbor that well? Well, no, but God would do it. God offers provision. He's provided for me. This is what I want to do. So go ahead and write this down with me. Uh, Two statements. This is going to kind of set us up um, for the message today. But two things, your journey matters and your journey is a witness. So culture says that the journey doesn't matter. It's just about getting from point A to point B. Who cares what happens in between? Who cares who you step over, who you crush, uh, who you forget about? It's all about getting to the destination. But we recognize as Christians that, that our journey, the highs and the lows, it's a witness. Everything that we go through, everything that we experience, the choices that we make, should reveal Christ, should reveal the Father in our lives. So some of you may be uh, successful businessmen or businesswomen. You may um, you know, lead companies, you may lead people, um, or you may have been a Christian for a long time and maybe you know, you've got the prayer life figured out a little bit better. We've got some prayer warriors that, that serve here. Um, we had somebody reach out to us this week just asking for prayer for a sick sister and, um, and we're able to kind of send people or, or offer our prayer services. And, um, and some of you may be new at it and, and that's okay, or maybe you've never prayed before. That's all right, too. But for those of you who who have seen success in your life in some way, um, if somebody sees that success, they typically are not going to ask you just, what are you successful at? They've already seen the success. What they're going to ask you is, how did you get there? What did you do to get to this point? I want to be there. And like we said before, our journey, our lives should be a witness to Christ. So when people see something different about us, we should want them to ask, how did you get here? Why are you so nice? Why do you care so much? Why do you love people who I don't think you should really love? Or why do you love me when I don't feel like I should be loved? And so that's what we're going to look at that journey today. So remember that your journey matters, and it's not about your Facebook journey, right? Your Facebook journey is the highlight reel, right? We're talking about the real journey, the real life stuff, because I know how to make it through the good times. Anybody know how to make it through good times? Right? That's easy. It's easy making it through the good times. It's when I hit a difficulty that I start to ask the questions, how do I do this? I'm lost. Nobody gave me an instruction manual on, on how to raise, the, raise these kids when they're acting like this. When they like me and they're happy and they're listening to me, I'm a great dad. When they disobey, now I'm like, I'm a failure. What do I do? I have no idea. So I'm going to surround myself with people. But the way we live, the choices we make, uh, it should reveal our relationship with our Father. So we're going to jump into the story of Elijah real quick. Um, We're going to jump ahead, and I'm going to read a verse, because sometimes I think we we read the Bible, um, and and I am guilty of this, but we read the Bible and read certain snippets, and they sound really cool, but we don't really know what's going on. It's like going to a movie and walking in, even during during the, uh, the previews, right? You walk in halfway through a preview, and you're like, oh, what movie is this? It looks awesome, but you're lost. If you walk in halfway through a whole movie, you've missed a lot. All the character buildup, the setting, you have no idea what's going on. Um, And I'm going to kind of take you through that to show you the journey of Elijah. But in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 11 through 13, it says, go out, and this is God speaking to Elijah, who's a prophet, go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. 
And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. So when you kind of jump into a story like that, you're kind of left wondering if this is the first time you've ever heard it, or maybe you've read it before, but you're still wondering, what is going on? A windstorm, there's rocks flying, there's fire, God's in a whisper. What is this all about? And so we need to look at the journey. So Elijah had made it to a place, but we need to see where he came from because I think it's going to speak to us. It's going to speak to us. Um, where are my Cliff Notes fans? Any Cliff Notes fans? Spartanus? Yeah, that's my brother, by the way. Yep. So Cliff Notes, that's the abridged version of every book. I taught him well. Uh, so just the real quick snippet. So if we read, um, it's, it's really mostly 17, chapter 17, 18, and 19 in 1 Kings where we see Elijah. And I would encourage you um, to read through the story completely, but we're just going to hit uh, the abridged portion, just some bullet points. And we're going to look at the journey that God calls Elijah on. So hang in with me. So Elijah was a prophet raised up to point the people, the Israelites, back to God Currently, there were kings ruling over Israel, and, and right now during um, Elijah's time, each of these previous kings, each of these previous kings, it says that they were doing evil in the sight of the Lord. They were doing evil in the sight of the Lord, and then they were like killing each other. So I'm going to kill you, and I take the throne, and then I do evil inside of the Lord, and then they kill each other. And this cycle is just kind of going on and on. So God calls Elijah to, to come and speak and to start pointing his people back to himself. Uh, but Elijah ends up uh, bringing some bad news to King Ahab, who's the current king. He tells him that there's going to be a drought. You're going to be without water for who knows how long, and Ahab is not happy. Ahab's not happy. So God sends Elijah to the wilderness um, and while he's in the wilderness, he is miraculously cared for. If you'll go ahead and put that first point up there. So we see this first part of, of Elijah's journey that, that God calls Elijah. Right, he calls Elijah, um, but what we're going to see now is how he cares for Elijah. And it's not probably how Elijah would have thought it would have been done. He sends him to the wilderness He's kind of by himself, and in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 4, it says, Drink from the brook and eat what the ravens bring you, for I have commanded them to bring you food. So God brings Elijah to a place where there's just this little brook, little creek, and he's got water to drink, and then his food is being delivered by birds. I don't know. Like I wouldn't have done it that way, uh, but that's how God is doing it. And, and for me, if I was in that situation... Um, I would hope that it starts to kind of trigger something in my head uh, that, okay, only God could be doing this, right? No person's serving me. Uh, my wife isn't there. There aren't ribs just sitting out there that somebody's serving to me. Excited about those, by the way. Um, but God calls Elijah, and then he starts to care for him. Um, and then after he is drinking from the brook and, and being fed you know, from the food from these birds, uh, the brook dries up. They're in a drought. And so uh, the brook dries up, and God sends Elijah to a widow. So he sends him to a widow who is gathering these sticks in this town to build a fire to make her last meal for herself and for her son. She said, we're going we're gonna to eat this last little bit of what we have, and we're just going to die. It's been a number of years now. They, they haven't been eating well. Crops aren't growing, and so they're just ready to die. But Elijah says, okay, I hear you, but make me some bread anyways. And she's like, I just told you, like, we have nothing. We're ready to die. But she does it, and she makes it, and in chapter 17, verses 15 through 16, it says, She and Elijah continued to eat for many days. There was always enough flour and oil. So every time she went back to the jar to make a meal, there was always provision, always provision. So we're seeing Elijah, he's called and he's being cared for in only ways that God could do it. And I've experienced that in my life where, you know, Provision has come at a time when I wasn't expecting it. Uh, we had a moment like that just this last week. Um, and those are the moments where I really, where I feel like God's like, remember, it's not what you do. You can't do this on your own. You need me. And so, uh, like Pastor Aldrich was talking about during communion, we have to remember. And so when it's ways that only God can do, we, we tend to remember a little easier. So after Elijah is called and cared for, God sends him out. So he's kind of prepared him. He's, he's set him up. He said, hey, I want you to do this thing, and I'm going to take care of you. Now be ready, because I've got something for you to do. 
So like a good father, he grows Elijah up in a way. He teaches him some things, shows him some things, and then he sends him out. Chapter 18, God sends Elijah to King Ahab, who has been looking for him for three years. So Ahab, he's on the lookout. This guy has stopped the rain. We have no crops. My animals are dying. My people are dying. He's mad. And when Elijah uh, meets up with King Ahab, he says, all right, Ahab, you know, I want to show you that my God is who he says he is. And so he says, summon all your prophets. So they were worshiping idols. They were worshiping Baal. They were worshiping Asherah, like just doing some crazy stuff. And he says, bring them all out. So 950 false prophets come out. And then Elijah stands on this side. So you've got Elijah, and you've got 950 false prophets. Each proclaims, uh, uh, so Elijah proclaims that he's the only prophet left. So he's kind of feeling a little bit alone. He kind of tells that to the people that are there. He tells that to the false prophets, to Ahab. Um, but it says they are each going to make an altar and sacrifice a bull. Each will have a chance to call on their God to burn up the sacrifice, and whichever... Whichever God burns up the sacrifice, that is the one true God. So it's kind of a standoff right now. Very interesting scene. Probably make for a good movie. Uh, but the prophets of Baal, it says that they dance, they rave, they carry on. Um, it says Elijah uh, scoffed at them because they were just hobbling around. I like that word hobbling. It's very, very interesting where you probably don't see it very much in the Bible. Um, it says they were just kind of just doing some nonsense. And lo and behold, after a full day of them just hobbling around, what do you think happened to their altar? Nothing. Nothing happened to their altar. And so Elijah says, all right, go ahead and dig a trench around this altar that I've built. So he builds up a little rock altar, put the pieces of the bull on there. He says, dig, dig a trench. And then after they dig a trench, he says, start pouring water over it. So they get these four huge jugs of water and they pour it and they pour it. And they, pour, they soak the whole thing, the wood, the stones, the sacrifice, so much water that it overflows the trench that they've dug around it. And now in my mind, you soak something with water, it's probably not going to catch on fire, right? But again, this is how God wants to reveal himself to his people. He, uh, and Elijah says in verse 37, O Lord, answer me. Answer me so these people will know that you, O Lord, our God. So again, Elijah recognizes that he wants this fire to consume the altar, not to show the people, see, I told you so. He wants it to consume the altar so the people will recognize who his father in heaven is. They want, he wants them to turn back to God. That's what he wants. Oh Lord, you are God. So you know where it's going? Fire consumes everything. Elijah ends up defeating all the false prophets, and the people that are left there, uh, they, they turn back to God. They start asking and, and talking to Elijah. Um, and then Elijah prays for rain. So now that he's, he's reconfirmed with the people, God is who he says he is. This altar has been burnt up. They're, turn, they're, they're starting to turn back to him, and he says, okay, now I'm going to pray for rain. So Elijah starts praying for rain. And Elijah tells Ahab to return to Jezreel, uh, which is where his wife, Queen Jezebel, is. And uh, she was not a nice lady. Not a nice lady. Lots of death uh, around Queen Jezebel. Um, and then God gives Elijah the strength. And this is another little part that, uh, where he's cared for, kind of showing his power. He gives Elijah the strength to outrun the chariot all the way back to the city. So the king takes off in his chariot, and he's thinking, all right, I'm gone. I'm going back to the city. Rain's coming. i got to look out. And Elijah's just like, gone. Just interesting. God just kind of throws that in there just to show his power. So after God has been uh, calling Elijah, he's cared for Elijah, he sends Elijah. The next step in Elijah's journey is that he actually ends up fleeing. He runs away. Because Jezebel finds out what he has done, and she's ready to kill Elijah. She's already killed a lot of other prophets. Um, she's killed a lot of other people, and she is, she is not, not a nice lady. And so um, Elijah's probably scared. He fears for his life. Um, and I think, you know, there must be a part of him that kind of forgets all the things that God had done. He forgets that birds fed him, that God took him to a place where there was plenty of water for him. He forgets that fire came down from heaven and torched this altar showing who God really was. And so there's a lot of mixed feelings there. And I think sometimes for us in our journeys, we get to places like that where, man, I feel like God's called me into this. He's taking great care of me. There's no way I could do this on my own. Yeah, I'm serving people. And then something gets hard. Maybe it's a relationship. 
Uh, maybe it's the work that you're doing, but something difficult happens and we kind of start to retreat. We start to retreat and the question becomes for us is, well, what do we do at that point? And unfortunately, some people, a lot of people, they hit that hard time and they don't come back from it. They don't turn from it. They, they don't see God anymore. They feel like he's turned his back. And so uh, Elijah's kind of at that point. But it says that Elijah runs and hides in the wilderness he kind of forgets, he, he, he moves away from this call that, that God's put him in. And in chapter 19, verse 4, it says, Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. So not only is he feeling alone, right? He's scared, and he picks a lone tree to sit alone under. It's kind of a pity party, right? So I'm, oh, that tree looks sad and alone. I'm going to go sit under there and be kind of sad and alone too. Um, so I thought that was interesting. But Elijah so quickly forgets that, that all that God has brought him through. And it says that he just lays there. He just lays there. But what I love and, and what I want to, to hit on here is the next step in his journey. Right? Elijah's the one who ran. Elijah's the one who kind of turned his back, who, who is scared, who doesn't know what's going on. And so God steps in as his father and he reminds him. So the next step, little reverse of the first. First, he called Elijah. He cared for him. Now he has to remind Elijah, Elijah, remember, I care for you. I love you. I've got you. And then he's going to call on Elijah again. So there, there's a reminder that we're going to see here. God sends an angel with food and drink. And this happens multiple times. So as Elijah's just laying there under the tree, feeling sorry, not knowing what to do, scared, right? I mean, his life is being threatened. God sends an angel multiple times, so many times with, with water and bread. It's just kind of appearing as he wakes up each time. Uh, he is fed enough to have the strength to travel for 40 days and 40 nights. So for 40 days and 40 nights, he travels to Mount Sinai where Moses had received the Ten Commandments, where Moses experienced the presence of God. So God takes Elijah back to a place where Elijah would know that, that this is where God is. So he was feeling kind of alone, but like a good father, even though God could meet him right there where he was, he gives Elijah a place where he remembers, oh, God has been here before. And so he takes Elijah to Mount Sinai, and this is where we pick up the story, and I'm going to read a little bit more than I did before. But in verse 9 in chapter 19, it says, There he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Now, if the creator of the universe asks you a question, you can guarantee that he already knows the answer. Right? He knows the answer. So he's clearly not searching for an answer from Elijah. He's not really trying to figure out, Hey, bud, what's going on? Why are you here? Now, I might ask my son that. I might ask my brother that. I might ask some friends that, what are you doing here? I had no idea you would be here or why you're here. But God asks, and Elijah replies, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I alone am left, and now they are trying to kill me too. So he starts kind of just pleading his case, right? Like, I'm alone. This is hard. I don't like this. And then we see the storm. Verse 11, Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. <clears throat> after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. So God brings Elijah to the mountain. He's in the cave, just lying there. I don't know what to do. This is hard. And I think for some of us, we find our place, we find ourselves in a place like that. I don't know what to do. This is hard. And so God, at first, does what we think he would do. He, he, he brings the power. He brings the storm. Rocks are flying. Flames, you know, earthquakes. The wind is howling. 
And that's where I think I would hear the powerful voice of our Father. But then he says, no, in a way. You saw those things. Yes, I can do all those things. But for Elijah, he reminds him that he's in the whisper. He's got to kind of realign Elijah's thinking. He's got to realign the way that Elijah is viewing the situation. He says, hold on, let me get your attention, and now will you listen to me? You hear me, right? It's all around you, but will you listen? And a voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And so again, like a good father, he allowed Elijah to kind of vent at first. Then he reminds Elijah who he is, and now he asks again, all right, bud, what are you doing here? Like, like let's, let's hear what's going on. And Elijah replies again, he repeats himself, I've zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars and killed every one of your prophets. I alone am left, and now they are trying to kill me too. So God speaks to Elijah in a way that he can hear him. He speaks to Elijah in a way that he needs to be spoken to. I see that with my own children, my daughter and my son. I speak to them very differently very differently, things that come up. The other day, um, and Caroline, I apologize, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell this story, but the other day, um, I hurt my daughter's feelings, uh, Paul and I both. Um, we were playing a fun little game, and, um, and we said something that hurt her feelings, and, and she started crying, and it broke my heart. And she was mostly mad at my son, and so I kind of let it go for a second, like, okay, she's mad at him, not me, but I knew deep down, like, I was part of this. Uh, we were, you know, playing a little game, and, um, and so I tried to talk to her, I tried to talk to her, and, and she just wasn't calming down. She wasn't. Uh, but then I thought back. Recently, she and a, one of her little friends, they were writing these worship songs, and they've been singing worship songs that they wrote around our house. And so I was like, okay, Paul, we're going to sing her an apology. So we typed out just this real quick little note on my phone, and we sung her the apology. And she, she took it, and she goes in her room, and then she makes her way back to us, and still with tears in her eyes, she sings her forgiveness to me. I was like, oh my gosh. Like, okay. So God just like took it one step further. So hear that? You got an awe, babe, you know? But I, but I knew like if that was my son, if that was my son, no. I mean, we're, we're going outside, we're shooting hoops, we're playing soccer, and we're, we're going to talk out whatever this thing is. But for her, that's how I need to speak to her. And, and thankfully, prayer, you know, through prayer, like I've learned to talk to my kids a little bit differently. And many of you who are parents or have seen other people parent, you, you start to kind of learn that. Hopefully, we learn that. And God treats us the same exact way. So after God has reminded Elijah who he is, he speaks to him. So once he's, once he's reminded him, he now speaks to him. And he tells him, where Elijah was feeling alone, no, Elijah... I'm going to set a new king over Aram. I'm going to set a new king over Israel. Hazael is going to replace you. 7,000 others who have not bowed down to Baal are going to rise up. So Elijah now finds out where he was thinking he was alone. There's over 7,000 followers of God that are around him. And, and, and we get in places like that where we feel like we're alone. Even sitting right here, you may feel like you're alone. And it's just reality. But God wants to speak back into your life. Elijah needed that wake-up call. So go ahead and write this down for me, and we're going to go right through these last three points as we finish up. The same God who spoke to Elijah is the God we worship today. Don't forget that. All these miraculous signs, all these things that God did for Elijah, that is the same God that we are worshiping here today. He has things for you, but it's not going to look like Elijah's story. It's not going to look like his journey. It's not going to feel like his journey. But it is the same God that we worship. And for the sake of time, we're going to go uh, right through uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 4 through 9. Um, so Samuel is uh, living uh, with the priest. Uh, Eli, he's young, he's about 11 years old, and, uh, and the Lord speaks to Samuel, and, he's, and he says, um, Samuel, yes, Samuel replies, and three times this happens, and each time Samuel goes to Eli. He goes to Eli and says, yes, you called me, and he's like, Eli's sleeping, he's like, I didn't call you, go back to bed. And he goes back again, I, it wasn't me, go back to bed. Again, 
what are you doing? And then Eli recognizes, I bet this is God speaking to you. So he says, Samuel, go back and lay down and listen. So Samuel heard God three times in a row, but there's a very difference between hearing and listening. Hearing is involuntary. Every single person in here hears me. Some of you might be listening. That is voluntary. You have to choose to listen. You have to choose to internalize the words that are coming out of my mouth, and then you give them context, and give them meaning, and they start to, to, to move inside of you. But if you're just here and you're just hearing, you, there's, not, there's going to be a lack of understanding. And so we see that with Samuel. Um, so the first point there is that uh, God speaks just with his voice. Sometimes he will speak directly to us. And as Christians, we believe uh, when we ask Jesus into our hearts, we have the Holy Spirit, and he speaks from the inside. In Psalm chapter 50, verse 23, but giving thanks is a sacrifice that truly honors me. If you keep to my path, I will reveal to you the salvation of God. I w you will hear my voice. If you keep to my path, you will. And then later on, in Acts 17, that very night, the believers sent Paul and Silas to Berea. When they arrived there, they went to the Jewish synagogue, and the people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica, and they listened eagerly to Paul's message. They searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. So the second point there is uh, we hear his voice uh, through his word. So he speaks to us through his word. And I love in, in those verses there, it says that the people, they heard Paul and Silas, they came to preach the good news, right? And so like me, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing this message with you, uh, but you shouldn't always just take somebody's word for it. God calls us back into his word to confirm. And so that's what they were doing in Berea. They were confirming these things that you're saying, do they match the, the ancient scriptures that we've been given? And if they do, they gave them the thumbs up. Keep talking. I want to hear more. In Psalm 48, 14, it says, For that is what God is like. He is our God forever and ever, and he will guide us until we die. This is a guide. It is not a textbook. It is not a book of historical facts alone. This is a guide. It is a, the living word. In Acts 14, 22, After preaching the good news in Derby and making many disciples, Paul and Barnabas returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch of Pisidia, where they strengthen the believers, they encourage them to continue in the faith, reminding them that we must suffer many hardships to enter the kingdom. And so our final point there, uh, we can hear through his people. So God's voice, we hear, he may speak directly to us, we may hear his voice, we have his word, and we have his people. It says that they strengthened them, they encouraged them, they reminded them about the kingdom of God. In Proverbs, it says, walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. So we have to be careful. We have to be careful who the people are that we're listening to. They may say they're speaking on behalf of the Lord. They may say that God told me this. Um, but what I love, and this is just something that I've taken into my own journey, and you see it um, throughout Scripture, is when we put all three of these together, his voice, his word, his people, it's a check and balance system. If somebody comes to you and says, I think God wants you to do this, does it line up with his scripture, and do you feel God calling you to it too? If you don't feel it lining up, be careful. If you feel like God is calling you to do something, to say something to somebody, but it goes against his, his own words, if it goes against the wise counsel, the wise counsel, not the fools, you probably don't want to do it. So it's a little check and balance system there. Something a little practical, uh, but something that we see all throughout Scripture. So God reveals himself to Elijah. He shows how powerful his voice is. And so here on Father's Day, um, you know, I want to remind us, I want to I challenge you men, those of you who are dads, those of you who are uncles and grandfathers, or maybe um, you're not any of the above, but at some point in your life, men, you're going to have an opportunity, really every point of your life, to point people to Jesus, that your life, your journey will point people to our Father in heaven. We have powerful voices. I want to take a look at some statistics here. So all of these statistics that I'm going to put up here represent uh, youth and children that come from homes that are fatherless. 
So completely fatherless homes. So 63% of youth suicides are children and youth who come from fatherless homes. Runaways. 90% of all homeless and runaway youths come from fatherless homes. Behavioral disorders. 85% of all children that exhibit behavior, behavioral disorders come from fatherless homes. High school dropouts. 71% of them. Fatherless homes. Juvenile detention rates. 70% of juveniles in state-operated institutions come from fatherless homes. Substance abuse. 75% of adolescent patients in substance abuse centers come from fatherless homes. This doesn't even take into account those homes where there's a broken relationship. The father's there, but he's not speaking into their lives. He's there, and he's speaking terrible things into their lives. Those numbers would increase. The voice of a father is powerful. The voice of the father is powerful. And so we need to learn how to hear the father's voice. And in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, this is what we're called to do. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. The greatest thing, dads, men, grandfathers, uncles, that we can offer the next generation, that we can offer our brothers, and even generations above us, the greatest thing we can offer them is this, that our journey, that our lives is a witness, that we are pointing people to the Lord. It doesn't matter how successful you are. It doesn't matter all the tips and tricks that you've figured out how to get through this life easier. The greatest thing we can do is that our lives point people to Jesus, that our lives point people back to the voice of the Father. And so for some of you today, uh, maybe you've never even started that relationship with Jesus. Maybe you've said, you say, I've never heard the voice of the Lord. We want to give you an opportunity, and we do this every single week. We want to give you an opportunity to start that relationship today. It's a simple prayer. Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Anybody who opens the door, I will come in and I will dine with him. It is that easy. If you just say yes, I need you. I want to see what this is all about. I want to hear the voice of the Father because I want to lead the next generation. I want to lead my children well. I want to lead my wife well. I want to lead those around me well and not so they follow me. I'm not up here so that you follow me, so that you agree with, with, with my words and my fill in the blanks. I'm here because I want to point you to the Father. I want you to hear the voice of the Father. That's what I want. That's what I want for my children. So with every eye closed and head bowed, for the comfort of anybody in here that might be saying this or praying for the first time, we're, we're all going to repeat this. Everybody's going to repeat this after me. So with your eyes closed and head bowed, I just want you to repeat this prayer after me. So everybody say, Dear Jesus, I give you my life, all of it. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Make me new. Cleanse me. All that I am is yours. In Jesus' name, amen.